quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs, the hearing entitled Crisis in Kyrgyzstan, Fuel, Contracts, and Revolution Along the Afghan Supply Chain will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the Subcommittee be allowed to submit a written statement for the record and without objection that too is so ordered. So good morning, everybody, and particularly our witnesses. I want to thank you again for being here today and helping to enlighten us on a region of the world that many Americans have not had an opportunity to uh, study in depth. So today's hearing will explore the recent revolution in Kyrgyzstan, the causes of the political turmoil there, and Kyrgyzstan's critical role in the supply chain for the United States and NATO's war effort in Afghanistan. Although, Ambassador, you make the good point that that cannot be the only and the sole focus uh, of our relationship. In addition, we'll examine the political and geopolitical significance of allegations of corruption in connection with the United States fuel contracts at the Manus Air Base in Kyrgyzstan. That is, of course, a critical transit and resupply hub for Operation Enduring Freedom. Last Monday, the subcommittee announced a wide-ranging investigation into allegations that the contractors who supply fuel to the Manus Air Base had significant financial dealings with the family of deposed President Kermanbek Bikiev. I understand from press reports that the interim government in Kyrgyzstan has announced its own investigation into allegations of corruption in the Bakiev regime, including the Manos fuel contracts. Of course, allegations of corrupt practices among Kyrgyz public officials are an internal Kyrgyz matter. However, some of the present allegations raise serious questions about the Department of Defense's management and oversight of contractors along the Afghan supply chain. Today's hearing will not answer the who, what, and where of the contractual dealings at Manus. You will also not test the veracity of allegations that are swirling around in Central Asia. These questions will be answered in due course by the subcommittee's ongoing investigation. Rather, the purpose of today's hearing is to look more broadly at the recent revolution in Kyrgyzstan, the Kyrgyz-American relations, the history of the United States presence at Manus, and the significance of the allegations of corruption at the base as a driver of the revolution. Since 2001, Kyrgyzstan has been a critical ally of the United States in support of our ongoing military efforts in Afghanistan. The Manus Air Base is a crucial hub for United States troops going in and out of Afghanistan as well as a refueling station for the United States and NATO aircraft operating in the region. Not unexpectedly, Kyrgyzstan's willingness to host the United States Air Base on former Soviet soil has generated some domestic controversy in Bishkek and even more controversy in Russia, which looks suspiciously at the United States' influence in Central Asia. As the United States has increased its presence in Afghanistan, our dependence on the Manos Air Base and the Northern Distribution Network, that of course is the supply chain to Afghanistan through Central Asia, has also increased. The United States' dependence is particularly acute at Manus. In March 2010 alone, 50,000 United States troops transited in and out of that base to Afghanistan. So let's be honest. At many times throughout our history, the United States has closely dealt with unsavory regimes in order to achieve more pressing policy or strategic objectives. That's realism in a nutshell. But the United States also prides itself on a more enlightened view of our role in the world and our long-term interest in universal respect for democracy, the rule of law, and human rights. Some suggest the United States has allowed strategic and logistical expedients in Kyrgyzstan to become a lasting embrace of two corrupt and authoritarian regimes. Regardless of U.S. intent, we're left with the fact that both President Akiev and President Bakiev were forcefully ousted from office amid widespread public perception that the United States has supported the regime's repression and fueled, I say that without any pun intended, their corrosive corruption. Meanwhile, the leaders of Kyrgyzstan's political opposition, the men and women who bravely confronted President Bekiev for his corruption and oppression, were left in the lurch. Today, many of those opposition leaders are in power, and I expect the United States will have to work hard to restore our credibility in their eyes, beginning with transparency regarding United States fuel contracts at Marnus. I wish them the good judgment to transform the art of Kyrgyz governance in a manner deserving of the Kyrgyz people. Ultimately, it's my belief that only transparency will help Kyrgyz American relations move forward to a new page. And toward that end, I look forward to our witnesses' thoughts on the future of this important alliance. And with that, I'd like to yield to Mr. Flake for his opening remarks. I thank the chairman and thank the witnesses for coming. Uh, Kyrgyzstan is, uh, 
at a turning point, it seems. Um, I think we're all hopeful that political stability will come. Um, we have a vested interest, as the chairman mentioned, certainly with the air base uh, as a supply hub uh, for our operations in Afghanistan. Uh, the existence of a U.S. base in a former Soviet uh, territory has uh, been troublesome uh, for Russia. Uh, to make matters worse, there's the longstanding allegations that uh, former uh, leadership uh, benefited illegally from Department of Defense fuel contracts, as has been mentioned. So there's no easy solution here, uh, particularly given the air base and the situation we have there. But uh, I look forward to any light that can be shed on the situation and what we can do as members of Congress uh, to, uh, to make sure that we have a, a secure situation for uh, our war efforts in Afghanistan and, and also to help lend stability to the uh, situation there. I uh, yield back. Well, thank you, Mr. Flake. Uh, the Chair recognizes Mr. Turner for unanimous consent request. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to request unanimous consent to make an opening statement. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to thank you and the ranking member for holding this hearing on what is a very important issue. And I'd like to pause for a moment to recognize in the back of the room we have uh, Dr. Conroy and her AP government class uh, from Georgetown Visitation. They are all seniors who are here today uh, participating uh, in the hearing, and they include my daughter, Jessica Turner. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for um, allowing me to recognize well, them. Well, the committee welcomes all the members of that class as well as their faculty, and uh, we hope you enjoy your stay in Washington and, and uh, appreciate uh, Jessica, your dad's good work on this committee. He does uh, really in-depth work and has, has been a leader here, and so we appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, for the last nine years, Kyrgyzstan has continued to assist the U.S. with our efforts in Afghanistan. Successive governments in Bishkek have resisted tremendous pressure from some other governments who would prefer the U.S. military bases be evicted from Central Asia. As a member of the House Armed Services Committee, I am frequently reminded of the critical contribution the Manas Transit Center makes to supplying the U.S. and NATO troops in Afghanistan. I was further reminded of Kyrgyzstan's strategic location during my visit there several years ago. Manas also plays a vital role in providing security and military assistance to the Afghan people. By doing so, this facility and U.S. presence there helps the Kyrgyz security. We are grateful for Madame Utenbayev's recent statements the lease for use of the transit center will continue for another year. This assurance comes at a critical time in the buildup of U.S. and allied counterinsurgency forces in Afghanistan. Furthermore, Manas creates other opportunities for the Kyrgyz public including economic benefits such as jobs, salaries, and good services procured, as well as humanitarian assistance provided by the military personnel base there. For example, the U.S. service members have assisted local orphanage by don orphanages by donating their time and money. However, our relationship with Kyrgyzstan and with Central Asia as a whole should not be seen exclusively through the prism of U.S. bases there or as an adjunct of our Afghan policy. Currently, the Defense and State Departments group Central Asia in the same bureaus and divisions of as Afghanistan and Pakistan. This organizational structure may act as an enabling factor for administration officials to pigeonhole Central Asian countries as simply a corridor to get to Afghanistan. We should have in place policies and strategies that look at Central Asian states as countries that have their own unique cultures, challenges, and possibilities. One of these possibilities is helping and encouraging the Kyrgyz people to create economic opportunity. Kyrgyzstan has little economic means today. The Kyrgyz people need economic opportunities and jobs to achieve long-term stability. Stability is in America's and NATO's military interests. Economic development is going uh, would help uh, perpetuate stability. Prosperity and stability in Kyrgyzstan is also in America's and Europe's economic interests. Most of the highways already exist um, for um, transportation. There is required investment that should assist the, the better border management and supporting infrastructure. And border control would also help stem narcotics flow out of Afghanistan, an issue that, that I am concerned about. To help the Kyrgyz invite more investment, its democratic friends around the world, including the United States, must help its government to increase transparency. I hope that the administration and non-governmental organizations, some of which are represented at this hearing, will assist the Kyrgyz Republic in creating ways that provide transparency for commercial transactions. This includes working with the new interim authorities to determine a way forward that eliminates any suspicion of wrongdoing by any party to remove lingering doubts the U.S. directly or indirectly condones con uh, corruption. In the near future, I will hope we will also be able to hear from administration officials to outline and describe U.S. strategies in the region. We need to ensure that we have a strategy not only to help Kyrgyz and its neighbors, but a strategy which continues to build upon and cultivate U.S. relationships in the region. Again, I want to thank the Chairman uh, for holding this hearing. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Turner. Is there any other member who would like to ask for unanimous consent for an opening statement? Otherwise, we have the opportunity to place them on the record, of course, as usual. The subcommittee will now receive testimony from the panel that is before us today. 
Uh, a brief introduction of each of them to, to begin, uh, starting with Dr. Eugene Husky. He's the William R. Keenan, Jr. Chair of Political Science at Stetson University in Florida. He also serves as an associate editor for the Russian Review and is a member of the editorial board for the Journal of Communist Studies and Transition Politics. Dr. Husky's work focuses primarily on transition politics and legal affairs in the former Soviet Union and its successor states of Russia and Kyrgyzstan. He's the author of several books and has published dozens of articles about the political affairs of Kyrgyzstan and other former Soviet states. He has been asked to speak before the CIA, the Department of State, and numerous universities in Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Europe, and the United States. Dr. Husky received a BA from Vanderbilt University, an MA from the University of Essex, and a PhD in politics from the London School of Economics and Politics. Ambassador Bakhtabek uh, Abdesayev is a distinguished visiting professor of history and political science at Utah Valley State College. From 1996 until 2005, he served as the Kyrgyz ambassador to the United States and Canada. And from 1995 to 2000, he was a member of the Kyrgyz parliament. Prior to that, Ambassador Abdesayev was appointed director of Kyrgyzstan's International Affairs Department under former President Askar Akayev. Ambassador Abdesayev specializes in international relations, diplomacy, and Central Asian comparative politics. He has published dozens of scholarly articles and op-eds on Kyrgyz politics. He is the author of Kyrgyzstan's Voice in Washington, Reflections of the Kyrgyz Ambassador on Bilateral Relations During the Transition Year. Ambassador Abdesayev holds a BS from the Bishkek Polytechnical Institute, a PhD from the Institute of Electronics, Academy of Sciences of Belarus, and an honorary professorship of the International Univers University of Kyrgyzstan. And Ambassador, I want to express the committee's uh, sympathies. I know you had personal losses uh, during this latest uh, uprising over there and lost three close members of your family and friends and amongst others. And so we extend our sympathy to you on that. I know this is difficult testimony for you today and a difficult period of your life. And we thank you for taking time out to share with us your experience and your, your knowledge of this area because it was, in fact, you that first uh, negotiated the agreement with respect to Manus. So you have particular um, insight for us on that. Thank you. Dr. Alexander Cooley is an Associate Professor of International Relations at Barnard College at Columbia University and is currently a Global Fellow with the Open Society Institute. His areas of expertise are the political transformation of post-Soviet Eurasia, the politics of United States overseas basing, and theories of contracting and organization. Dr. Cooley has written two books, including Base Politics, Democratic Change in the United States Military Abroad, which examines the political impact of United States military bases in overseas host countries, including Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. He obtained his BA from Swarthmore College, a master's in philosophy from Columbia University, and a PhD from Columbia University. Scott Horton is an attorney, a lecturer at Columbia Law School, and a contributing editor for Harper's Weekly. Mr. Horton is known for his work in emerging markets and international law, especially human rights law and the law of armed conflict. He is a lifelong human rights advocate and co-founder of the American University in Central Asia, where he currently serves as a trustee. Mr. Horton is also a member of the board of the National Institute of Military Justice and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Mr. Horton holds a BA from the University of Maryland and obtained his JD from the University of Texas following studies at the University of Munich and Mainz in Germany as a Fulbright Scholar. And Sam Patton is the Senior Program Manager for Eurasia at Freedom House from 2008 to 2009, Mr. Patton served as a senior advisor for the democracy promotion at the Department of State. Prior to that, he headed the International Republican Institute's Moscow office and directed its political programming in Baghdad from 2004 to 2005. Mr. Patton has also helped manage democratically focused campaigns in Ukraine, Georgia, Romania, Albania, and northern Iraq. And prior to his international career, Mr. Patton served as an advisor to Senator Susan Collins and a speechwriter to Senator Olympia Snow. Uh, Mr. Patton obtained his BA from Georgetown University. So we have a lot of firepower here today. We expect to uh, really learn a lot. And again, we want to thank you for being here, sh uh, sharing your uh, expansive expertise. It is, of course, the uh, policy of the committee to swear in witnesses before they testify. So I ask you to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will please reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Again, I remind you that your full written statement will be put into the hearing record, and I appreciate as to the members of the committee how extensive those written remarks were and how helpful they are in getting our uh, background together. We'll allot about five minutes for opening remarks, 
The light will turn will be green, and with a minute to go, it'll turn to amber. And when the five minutes are up, it'll turn to red, and the floor drops, and out you go. Uh, but basically, we won't do that. We, we're appreciative of you being here. We'll add some latitude on that, but we do want to get to a point where we can have some questions and answers exchanged back from the committee members to the panel. So, uh, Dr. Husky, will you please start? You, you need to turn the microphone on. Thanks. Great. And pull it a little closer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Flake, and subcommittee members for giving me the opportunity to speak about U.S. Kyrgyz ties and about the country of Kyrgyzstan, which I've been studying for the last two decades. Much of my testimony today is based on interviews that I conducted with three dozen members of the Kyrgyz opposition during the last two years. Many of those interviewees have now assumed prominent posts in the new government, and five of them make up the new collective leadership of the country. We are here today because the United States tried to please a dictator. We all understand that difficult decisions have to be made in wartime, but our embrace of the Bakiyev regime in Kyrgyzstan was far tighter than it needed to be in order to retain our basing rights in that country. This became clear to me when I began interviewing uh, opposition leaders in July 2008. They complained that for the first time in the post-communist era, they were shunned by the U.S. Embassy in Bishkek. In late April 2009, the opposition candidate for president, Almaz Atambayev, told me that neither he nor other opposition politicians had been able to meet with the new U.S. ambassador, even though she had been in her post for more than six months. Atambayev was by no means a radical politician. He was a former prime minister and a successful businessman. He is now, in fact, the first deputy leader of the interim government, the number two man in the country. I heard the same refrain of isolation from the heads of NGOs in Bishkek. They had become untouchables in the eyes of the United States government. These NGO leaders were smart, energetic, and anxious to take their country in a liberalizing direction. With the U.S. Embassy out of the picture, the Russian Embassy in Bishkek stepped into the breach, and for the first time, Russian diplomats started to cultivate contacts in the Western-oriented NGO community. This was the opening gambit in what would become a more balanced Russian policy towards government and society in Kyrgyzstan. In spite of our numerous concessions to the Bakiyev regime, including the granting of lucrative contracts that are the subject of today's hearings, I would argue that the recently vented anger of Kyrgyz leaders and ordinary citizens over the airbase does not reflect an inherently um, anti-American sentiment in the country. It derives instead from a sense that the United States betrayed its own principles and the forces of change in Kyrgyzstan in order to curry favor with a despotic ruler who held the key to the airbase. It also, I should add, reflects popular frustration with a decade-long history of Kyrgyz presidents selling or leasing pieces of the country's territory to the highest foreign bidder. These bidders have included Russia, Kazakhstan, China, Uzbekistan, and the United States. Let me turn finally to a few of the issues that will shape the future of the air base and U.S.-Kyrgyz relations more broadly. First, it is vital that the interim government in Bishkek consolidate its authority throughout the country. The air base cannot function properly against the backdrop of sporadic civil unrest, never mind a civil war. The country is deeply divided along north-south lines, and pockets of resistance to the revolution remain in the south. Because the revolution was made in the north by northerners, and because the deposed president was from the south, there is great concern in the south that the interest of this historically disadvantaged region will not be fully represented in Bishkek. The interim government has made a good start by including two leaders from the south in its senior ranks, but there is still much work to do. Second, who rules Kyrgyzstan and how will be determined in the next six months by the introduction of a new constitution and the holding of new elections. The new constitution is likely to strip the presidency of much of its power and strengthen the parliament. This should make politics more competitive, but it may also complicate future negotiations over the air base. The United States administration may need to gain the support of a coalition of parties instead of a single individual as in the past. As elections grow closer, 
the tensions within the collective leadership will increase because the focus of the rulers will shift from governing to campaigning for their party or for the presidency. It is at this point that the system is likely to be at its most fragile, and there will be the greatest temptation for Kyrgyz politicians to use the airbase at Manas as a whipping boy in order to advance their own electoral prospects. It's in the interest of the United States, then, to have a thorough and early airing of our misdeeds with regard to the base and the Bakiyev regime. We do not want the next elections in Kyrgyzstan to be swayed by an October surprise that could reveal embarrassing details of our earlier policy toward the country. I welcome, therefore, your efforts to investigate our policies towards the Bakiyev regime. I also welcome the early signs from the administration that we will be pursuing a new strategy of engagement with governments and societies in Central Asia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Doctor. We appreciate your remarks. Ambassador. <coughs> Dear Mr. Chairman, Dear Ranking Member Flake, dear members of the uh, subcommittee, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I would like to express my uh, sincere gratitude for uh, inviting me to testify before your committee on the recent change of government in Kyrgyzstan and its impact for the U.S.-Kyrgyz relations. When um, upheaval of April 6-7 happened in Kyrgyzstan, I was teaching my students in Utah at Utah Valley University. And uh, this time, in comparison with the events five years before, the uh, regime of the deposed President uh, Bakiev, as he promised, used uh, live ammunition against protesters. And uh, uh, soon, like many others in Kyrgyzstan, I felt a great pain from it. Among those who fell, uh, struck by the two bullets in the head, was uh, my nephew, 35 years old, uh, uh, Rustan Shambetov. One of my wife's cousins, Mirlambek Turdaliev, 21 years old, uh, who was uh, raised as an orphan in Jalalabad, the same city from which uh, the president, deposed President Bakiev, was also struck. Then uh, one more person, Joel Dashbek Kudaybergenov, 36 years old, journalist, who was just witnessing that process and tried to write uh, uh, some uh, news about that. He was uh, struck by the bullet. So uh, this is also the proof that uh, there were uh, so many people there involved, not just uh, the crowd and mob, but uh, many people who are just sincerely, genuinely uh, trying to uh, uh, witness the changes and what's going on. So uh, the upheaval uh, cost uh, for us dearly 85 uh, people uh, so far, and uh, hundreds and hundreds still uh, there in the hospitals. And now the Kyrgyz people there um, want, first of all, accountability for the government, which was undermined by corruption and nepotism, and uh, also a uh, government which authorized the use of lethal force against uh, protested uh, citizens. But they also want a new government, and uh, they have uh, high expectations from the people who are now in uh, government interim, who would restore democratic freedoms, assure free access to the market, and end the system of corruption and patronage. And they're also asking questions. Uh, most important, is America truly our friend? And uh, if so, then, first, America should demonstrate its commitment to democracy and the values of an open society with more than just words. Second, America should also remember that Kyrgyz civil society despite uh, to the questions, quite a, a sharp one and uh, uh, not pleasant about the procurement contracts, etc., still continues to view America as a model for emulating. Third, America should remember that its support, for example, for education in Kyrgyzstan has had a far more positive impact on our country than the transit center. U.S. founded American University in Central Asia is now among the most prestigious universities in Central Asian region, and uh, America can show it cares about our country, but continue such generous support for education where it's shaping our country's future. And as far as uh, the area base MANA is concerned, I would like to remind you first that its major aim was and still continues to be to support U.S. military operations in the war in Afghanistan, and as a result of that, to maintain security for the Kyrgyz Republic against external threats that originate in that country. Therefore, from the beginning, the air base operation, the issue of payment was never our primary concern. 
The Kyrgyz government was focused on the threat to its own soil and population originated from Afghanistan starting from 1999 when the, for the first time we experienced incursions of the Al-Qaeda to our uh, soil and as a result of the three years before that 9-11 we experienced such an attacks and we lost 55 lives of our people in uniform and citizens. So therefore when uh, United States uh, came with uh, such a proposal we uh, welcomed that and said as a uh, President Akayev mentioned in 2002 during his visit to Washington DC at CSIS that uh, Kyrgyzstan will make its own contribution in the fight with this great evil terrorism. And we are not asking for the money. Uh, because uh, this is our own fight for the triumph of democracy and the right to enjoy its fruits, to live in peace and prosperity. And I'm really grateful to you for um, Again, uh, having these hearings when we uh, talk why and how the issues from such kind of strategic importance now shifted to uh, the issue about the uh, so-called corrupted practices from both sides. And uh, I know that my colleagues, they have a lot of uh, to offer. But uh, my, uh, again, uh, main message, uh, we have to uh, restore our cooperation in wide range uh, uh, issues. And uh, where the uh, issue of the base is uh, extremely important for us uh, to continue to keep its presence again as a uh, 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 strategic uh, importance for us against the threat from Afghanistan but at the same time to pay attention to other areas education political and uh, economic reforms which could uh, help for the country to continue to be advanced as uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, country uh, uh, in the Central Asia which deserve its own uh, right in place in the international community thank you much Thank you very much, Ambassador. Dr. Cooley. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Tierney, Ranking Member Flake, distinguished members of the subcommittee uh, for this privilege of addressing you today. I'm a political scientist who has studied the Manasseh Air Base since its establishment in 2001 and studied it in a comparative context, uh, viewing developments related to the base in comparison to other bases that we have in places like East Asia, Southern Europe, and other post-communist states. Regrettably, it is not surprising that the U.S. military presence has become intertwined with allegations that the U.S. supported the repressive and corrupt rule of President Korman Bakiev. Um, and at the same time, I do believe we have the opportunity now, if we act, um, I think, with some foresight and we act aggressively, to salvage the base. Um, I think it's important at the outset to understand that the base has come to mean different things for Kyrgyzstan and the United States. For us, it's naturally this important, vital hub uh, to support mission in Afghanistan. And for the Kyrgyz, when it was first established, uh, this was also the security purpose. However, the base's role within Kyrgyzstan has evolved since its establishment. And uh, during the Bakiyev regime, and I would argue the latter stages of the Akayev regime, the base became viewed primarily as a domestic source of rents, income, and patronage. So this is why the United States has to pay quid pro quo to uh, establish uh, its presence in Kyrgyzstan, that it lacks the authority just because of this vital international mission to keep the base. Now, this quid pro quo has been both official in the form of rental payments that have gone from 2 million to 17 million to the current 60 million, um, but some of the quid pro quo is also tacit, and this is when we get into the business of base-related service contracts and fuel contracts. Unfortunately, both these official and these tacit payments have accrued, tended to accrue rather to Kyrgyz elites and have not benefited um, Kyrgyzstan uh, uh, and Kyrgyz development as a whole. So the base means very different things to each side. Um, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, Mr. Chairman, the base also became a symbol uh, of the U.S. indifference to regressions in uh, Kyrgyzstan's human rights and democracy. Uh, also, the base itself was viewed not only as a symbol, but as, as an actual site of um, Bakiev's greed and cronyism, right? It, it functioned as a daily reminder of what this regime had become. Um, the point I want to make in my, in my uh, remarks to you is that we learned actually the wrong lessons about the relationship between political authoritarianism, stability, and basing rights. Uh, many DOD and State Department officials I talked to pointed to the example of Uzbekistan as a cautionary tale of what can go wrong, where in 2005, after the crackdown of Uzbek security services against demonstrators in the eastern city of Andijan, 
Um, there was a wave of international criticism, including from the U.S. State Department. Uh, the Uzbek government became very concerned about our political commitment to them. Um, this was also in the middle of the colored revolutions. And this led to a series of events um, that uh, resulted in the eviction of the U.S. military from the Karshi Kanabad K-2 facility in the summer of 2005. So the lesson seems to have been learned, don't push Central Asian governments on human rights and democracy, uh, otherwise you'll jeopardize the base. But the fact of the matter is that Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan have very different political cultures. Uh, Kyrgyzstan is considerably more open, uh, has a better civil society, and its security services are not as repressive and never have commanded the loyalty of the regime as they have uh, in Uzbekistan. And you saw that in both 2005 and 2010, the security services did not go to the mat um, for this uh, uh, Kyrgyz regime. So, uh, that's one thing, that we sort of thought there was this kind of one Central Asian political culture that fits all. Uh, a second point I, I would make is that we started viewing uh, uh, Bakiev's authoritarianism as in and of itself um, evidence of political stability, right? Uh, when in fact it was protests, popular protests against electricity rate hikes and against the greed and corruption of the regime uh, that led to its destabilization. So I would just make those two points. Uh, recommendations going forward, uh, we do have to mend fences with the Kyrgyz government and quickly. I think we can offer financial support for very specific goals that we can agree with. For example, helping them finance this upcoming presidential election that will be so open. Second, I think U.S. officials should publicly declare their willingness to cooperate with any Kyrgyz investigation into Bakiev era base related business practices and open these transactions to public scrutiny. I realize these are going to inconvenience certain parties, but the symbolism is important. This has to be treated as a political crisis, not as a legal matter. And one suggestion I would have is look at ways in which base-related contracts can accrue into the Kyrgyz national budget as opposed to private entities with offshore registrations. Um, finally, I think both the President and the Congress should recommit to supporting Kyrgyzstan's democratization and support the appropriate uh, programs. Uh, my final point, yes, the base was extended for a year and we're all grateful for that, but we are entering a campaign cycle now where this will become a political pinata. Uh, for populist politicians to really link the base to an unpopular U.S. support, or rather, to U.S. support of an un unpopular dictator. So, as Professor Husky mentioned, it is imperative that we take these actions now and not in October when the campaign is in full swing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Dr. Cooley. Uh, Mr. Horton. Chairman Tierney, Ranking Member Flake, and distinguished members, it's a great honor for me to uh, appear before you today and talk about the situation in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and I want to start by noting my colleague Alex Cooley's comment. He says we need to look at this as a, a political matter rather than a legal matter. And I'll submit we have to look at it both ways. I submit that principally because I'm a lawyer and it's my duty here to look at the legal issues. Uh, and that's what I've done. But I also feel uh, that's a fundamental aspect of the political controversy in Kyrgyzstan today. This revolution, reduced to one word, was about corruption. Now, all the political leaders that I've talked with uh, agree. And in the wake of the revolution, there's a great deal of talk about the rule of law and transparency. And the question I hear thrown at me as an American when I talk with them over and over again is, what is your commitment to the rule of law and transparency? You talk about this all the time, and we don't see it in your conduct in our country. Uh, and uh, I'm ashamed to say I think they have a valid point. Um, so I looked uh, with some care about the publicly available information uh, uh, concerning the fuel contracts that were written relating uh, to Manas. And I note in my remarks that, uh, you know, we don't have the quality of information the prosecutor could use to bring a case, but I think we can draw some conclusions from this information. And the first is that there are numerous red flags of the sort traditionally used by our Department of Justice in looking at uh, bribery, bribery cases relating to public contracts, which suggests strongly that we may be looking at a violation of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and other anti-bribery statutes. And certainly there's, uh, there's sufficient red flags to merit the opening of a formal and detailed inquiry into what transpired. 
Um, the second thing is looking at the structure of these uh, contracts and looking particularly at Red Star and Minacorp. Um, the two entities which received uh, in excess of $1 billion uh, in fuel supply contracts. Um, there are very disturbing questions concerning uh, these companies. They appear to have come out of nowhere with no prior track record of involvement in this sector. Uh, the individuals uh, involved with them uh, have uh, copious connections to the United States government, but not really very much to the fuel supply industry. Um, and the contracting relationships themselves are, in the word, extraordinary, not consistent with traditional uh, contracting rules and approaches. In fact, yesterday, uh, an article by Aaron Rostin, uh, he secured and uh, released and published a memorandum of uh, agreement that was entered into between the Department of Defense and Red Star, which I examined, and I have to say I was just shocked by it. It's no nothing like a traditional contracting document. All this together shows the absence of an arm's length relationship between Red Star and the Department of Defense. And I think that's quite troubling because, of course, it's Red Star and Minacorp that uh, historically did do contracts with President Nikayev's family. I think that that information is really quite well established and are accused of having uh, concluded similar contractual arrangements with entities controlled by President Bakiev. In any event, that accusation is out there, presented very sharply by the Kyrgyz government, and it's incumbent upon us to operate transparently, get to the bottom of the facts, and admit we made a mistake if, in fact, we did. Um, uh, I also uh, am concerned about the role the U.S. Department of Justice has played in this, because after the 2005 revolution, the Justice Department did come in, did conduct an investigation, uh, and appears to have given a wink and a nod to uh, these arrangements involving uh, Red Star uh, and Minacorp. And I think that raises serious questions in my mind about their understanding of this contract corruption issue, particularly because this occurs at a time when our Justice Department is telling us uh, that uh, procurement contract fraud is a priority for the Department of Justice. Indeed, they say it's a national security issue. And I don't see how we can reconcile the way they behaved in this case with those sorts of of statements. Well, in the end, how our Defense Department contracts for services at Manas makes a statement about how we view Kyrgyzstan. Is this a fellow democracy that shares our values in the rule of law and transparency? Or do we view this country as congenitally corrupt and governed by competing bands of kleptocrats, where we have to use walking around money to accomplish goals, and we define the relationship only in short-term ways, because we're really not looking for a long-term relationship. Of course, the simple truth is that Kyrgyzstan is not a well-established, stable democracy, but it's also not some sort of uh, Hobbesian nightmare. The people in Kyrgyzstan have very, very high aspirations. Uh, and the question is, what's the path forward? How are we going to proceed? Are we going to work with the Kyrgyz and support their aspirations for a modern democracy uh, that lives up to the values that we both articulate? Uh, or are we going to continue dealing with them in a way that uh, shores up a corruption in the country uh, and autocratic rule? Uh, and I think the approach of the last few years is not worthy of the United States and is not worthy of Kyrgyzstan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Horton. Uh, Mr. Patton. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Tierney, uh, Congressman Flake, for the opportunity to speak and other members uh, on behalf of Freedom House to this subcommittee. In his novel, The Last Tycoon, Scott Fitzgerald wrote that there are no second acts in American lives. In view of recent events, a fitting question for this hearing and for those who are concerned about Kyrgyzstan's future is whether there is indeed a second act in store for Kyrgyzstan, the far distant mountainous Soviet state that's little known to the American people. I would argue that there is, if we learn the correct uh, lessons from the re recent experience, those, those lessons uh, would be the, the first application of such lessons in the former Soviet Union. In no instance since the color revolutions between 2003 and 2005 have any of the former dictators been brought to account for their crimes against their people. Unfortunately, Mr. Bakiev's exit from, from Kyrgyzstan denies the Kyrgyz people the opportunity to hold him 
and his regime to account for the crimes that he committed. However, hopefully the full investigation that other witnesses have talked about and alluded to will be conducted and there will be an opportunity to bring the Bakiyev family to account for, for the crimes that no other former Soviet leader has to date been called to account for. Freedom House is probably best known for the rankings that we produce each year of freedom in the world, nations in transit, taking a look at all of the countries of the former Soviet Union and indeed the world. Um, this year, we, for the first time, we downgraded Kyrgyzstan to not free in January uh, for a var variety of reasons having to do with the Bakiyev government's relationship with the media, its increasing censorship, the violence with which it dealt with journalists, and its increasing political repression. In the spirit of fairness, I took our report to the then Kyrgyz ambassador in Washington, Zamira Sadikova, who was a relatively thoughtful woman and a former journalist, much, uh, much in the same spirit as the interim leader, Rosa Otumbayeva, to have a conversation and to explain to her why Freedom House downgraded Kyr Kyrgyzstan to not free. She listened to the reasons that I laid forth and that were in our reports, and at the end of our discussion, she asked, why is it that the State Department no longer talks to us about democracy? It used to be that every sentence the State Department would say to us would include the word democracy. Now they only talk to us about trade. If your State Department does not care about democracy, why should we? I was stunned by her reaction to the report. And indeed, there is an important responsibility. Uh, much blame has been put on the Department of Defense. Uh, for the recent events that have happened in Kyrgyzstan, I think it's important to look at the role in a whole of government approach that the State Department also needs to play. We've seen in the New York Times the fairly apocryphal account of uh, an opposition leader, which has been mentioned here today, visiting the United States Embassy and uh, saying that the revolution begins on Wednesday and the diplomat with whom he spoke said, oh yeah? Um, other opposition figures, as, as we've heard, were not received at the United States Embassy. And in fact, Congress passed the Advanced uh, Dem Democratic Values Act in 2006. Uh, there is a law on the books requiring senior U.S. diplomats to actively outreach and engage opposition figures, human rights activists, and others in all countries where the United States conducts diplomatic relations. Kyrgyzstan should be no exception. The other countries of the former Soviet space should be no exception. The recent incident in Kyrgyzstan and the ongoing, uh, the ongoing tumult that comes from the events of the last two weeks puts the regional uh, situation, particularly with Kazakhstan, as the chairman of the OSCE in a unique perspective. Kazakhstan's becoming the first chairman of the OSCE east of Vienna certainly is a historic precedent. The events of the last two weeks uh, presented the first opportunity in Kazakhstan's chairmanship of the OSCE to actively engage in a constructive way to diffuse violence, uh, to put monitors on the ground and work in the process of healing the country of Kyrgyzstan. They failed. Uh, they failed to deploy ODIR, which had the monitors and the resources necessary to engage and instead reverted to old style former Soviet diplomacy, uh, in effect uh, whisking Bakiev off through Kazakhstan to Belarus, where he safely sits today. I think that's an important lesson looking forward about just the role of multilateral institutions in the OSCE in particular, and how it was intended to, uh, to, to be used in situations like this, and how perhaps in the, in, in the balance of Kazakhstan's chairmanship, uh, uh, it, c it can do a better job. Looking also in the regional perspective, there are lessons to be learned here with respect to uh, Uzbekistan in particular. And the, the, the case was raised that Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan are not uh, uh, similar in many circumstances. However, the lessons are the same. The lessons that, the, uh, that we've learned in Kyrgyzstan is backing up a single dictator does not put us in a very good position when a revolution happens. The question with Uzbekistan is not if the revolution will happen, but when it will happen. And do we want to be in the same position uh, sitting here at this table wondering what happened when things do change in Uzbekistan as we are today? Um, a careful look and review of the situation and how Kyrgyzstan got to where it is hopefully will put us in a better position when that comes. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Patton. Thank all of our witnesses for your testimony, both written and oral. It's, it's been informative on that. We're going to go into a, a question and answer period here, about five minutes per, uh, per member, and we'll go around more than one cycle if that's uh, amenable to all the witnesses and, and the members desire it. Uh, 
You know, Mr. Patton, it's, it's not unusual for the United States. We go back in our history, unfortunately, and find out uh, how often diplomatically we've chosen to support somebody who was authoritarian in nature or convenient to moving our priorities forward as opposed to keeping those open contacts with opposition leaders as well and, and playing a different role. Pakistan comes to mind, General Musharraf, and, and uh, as a more recent thing, but it goes on and on. Let me ask first, though, to all the witnesses here. I, I'm hearing that um, it's a good idea to do this investigation. It's a good idea to do it early on. Uh, it's a good idea to be as inclusive and thorough as we can be. And yet, on the other hand, I'm hearing that uh, doing that may give fodder to uh, sort of a pinata sort of uh, situation uh, when the election is coming up in that country. So can you weigh or balance for me the pros and cons of that? in any order people want to speak up. Uh, Mr. Dr. Cooley, you've been nodding away. Do you want to speak first? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> I think the base is going to be a pinata whether we have the investigation or not. I think candidates are positioning themselves. They have all the fodder that they need uh, to make these connections. And again, uh, this operates in Kyrgyz political space. This is regardless of you know, what the intentions may or may not have been on the part of the state or DOD. The base will be an issue. That is why having an investigation, uh, uh, being contrite about some of the arrangements, all of this is important to give uh, uh, domestic political support to those factions, to those candidates that want to maintain the base and have good relations with the U.S. Sure, Mr. Horton, go ahead. could just add, uh, I think investigations are occurring because the Kyrgyz side is conducting an investigation. And while we talk about transparency, uh, actually, I think all of, uh, all of us who have tried to look into the issues surrounding these contracts have discovered very quickly we can get much more detailed information much more quickly in Bishkek than we can get it in Washington. There are prosecutors out there right now doing detailed investigations. Information is circulating about the pricing of the fuel contracts right now. Copies of the documents are circulating. It's out there. Uh, and frankly, it will behoove us to conduct our own investigation and be out there with conclusions ahead of them. We've got to view it in that context. Well, Mr. Horton, as long as you're on that context, I, I take note of your comment that uh, there are United States individuals connected uh, with some of these companies like uh, Red Star and, and um, I mean, it's, it, it, So tell me a little bit about that, why we should be cautious of that and, and what you know so far. Well. Um, uh, uh, again, I, I viewed this from a, from the, a perspective of traditional analysis of the FCPA as it will be applied in the commercial setting. And I said, you know, if we viewed this as a commercial the FCPA contract. FCPA being the Federal Foreign Pro Corrupt Practices Federal. Act. Uh, and uh, one thing that prosecutors do applying this is they look to these sorts of, of contract and subcontracting relationships and test is there really an arm's length relationship between the original company and the first tier contractor. And applying those tests, we come to a conclusion very quickly there is no such arm's length relationship. And that's using the traditional factors. Who are the officers? Who are the people who are working in the company? Uh, what's its tradition? Uh, what's its business history? Has it operated in this sort of business in the past? What volume of business does it have before? How are the contracts concluded? Was there open bidding for it? How are competitive? You apply all these tests and it flunks every single test, uh, which means using the traditional Department of Justice analysis, not arm's length. Thank you. Ambassador, what do you say about the Akiev uh, regime when it was in power? Do you believe that it was uh, corrupt as well as the Bakayev? Do you take no position on that? Or what information do you want to share? Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to say, first of all, about the previous question as well. I think that such a uh, uh, type of investigation will be quite important for the fellow democracy, emerging democracy, to learn lessons from the uh, leading democracy in the world. How some of the problems, peculiarities, has to be resolved in a uh, legal framework, and it will be really great. Uh, first and uh, um, uh, secondly, about the corrupted practices, I think uh, this is an issue where uh, we have to now uh, uh, again admit that uh, during the uh, archives uh, uh, regime, uh, when um, I was an ambassador uh, uh, in 2003, I was uh, at the uh, John. Uh, Gene Huskies uh, University, and I, I was grilled on the same issue seven years ago. And uh, I uh, admitted that uh, probably, yes, 
because president's uh, family is involved in that business. But uh, uh, guys, uh, how we have to regulate it? What kind of legislations and uh, framework we to do? Uh, because uh, uh, it is an issue where our country has to uh, admit and then further to resolve it. And probably this investigation will help uh, for us to not to allow for the uh, rulers uh, to do something which uh, people view as uh, uh, against their uh, again. Uh, their uh, benefits and for their wealth. But uh, secondly also, uh, it would help uh, for us uh, to understand what are the reasons that uh, the base now uh, changed its status from being the strategically important in order to uh, protect them from the external threat and had become a, a source of a, such a controversy. Because we have another example in Kyrgyzstan of the famous company Kumtor, uh, gold mining. It experienced the uh, same kind of problems during two or three years. And we have just a couple of uh, such a projects. Why? We are in a, such a bottleneck when people now view the U.S. base just a source of the uh, money. And it's uh, quite an important uh, question, which I think uh, this investigation also would help to resolve. Well, thank you very Mr. much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could I speak to the comparison of President um, Akayev and Bakiev on this point? So there being no objection, sure, go right ahead. Um, it's true that both were corrupt, both regimes were corrupt, but the degree of corruption in the most recent regime of Bakiev was far greater, bringing his son right into the, the central core of the executive branch. The other difference, however, didn't have to do with corruption, but it had to do with a level of repression. In Akayev, it was still possible to have a relatively vibrant civil society. That was being destroyed since 2007. We had a criminalization of the state in Kyrgyzstan where law enforcement authorities were intermingled with criminal groups, where the former chief of staff of the president was incinerated in his car because he dared to flirt with the opposition. We had journalists and opposition politicians being killed, members of the parliament being killed. This kind of thing didn't happen under Akayev. So I think there was a, a qualitative difference between the Akayev and the Bakiev eras. Thank you. Thank you for that. Mr. Flake, you're recognized. Um, we've spoken about the uh, air base and Dr. Cooley, uh, the air base being used politically, and, and uh, Dr. Husky, if, Dr. Husky, if you could elaborate, how will this be used in a political campaign? Is there popular support in the population uh, for the air base? Do, does the population simply want the revenue to trickle down a, a, little, uh, a little more freely? Or what, what kind of politics are going to be used with the air base? If you could elaborate that. Again, as I was suggesting, the air base has to be seen as a part of a decade-long history of Kyrgyzstan either selling or auctioning its territory. It began at the end of the 1990s with a Chinese border delimitation. Where, China, where Kyrgyzstan lost 250,000 acres to China. There are lots of rumors about the president at the time taking money and other members of the cabinet. Kazakhstan was given territory. Uzbekistan was on the verge of getting a very sweet deal. Uh, so unfortunately, now Manas is a part of that tradition. And I don't think we could say that uh, in the Kyrgyz population, the base is terribly popular. They've I think forgotten what happened in 2001. It's almost a decade beyond that, beyond that point. And as Ambassador Abdurisayev was saying, the incursion of people from Afghanistan through southwestern Kyrgyzstan at the end of the 1990s, which alarmed the population and the government uh, large. But now I think it, it is not a terribly popular uh, idea. The only thing I would say is that it is possible that some of the parties that are now separate will come together before the election. If they do, one could imagine a moderate stance on this, an accommodationist stance. The danger would be that that kind of fused party would be outflanked by a party willing to, again, hit the pinata, as uh, Professor Cooley says, with the air base issue. Okay. Okay. Dr. Cooley, and then, sure. The base will certainly be an issue in the campaign, but it's not going to be the only issue, and I would argue it wouldn't be the prime issue. What, what drove the events of the last two weeks were um, 
anger about, as, as was stated, um, the increase in electricity and gas tariffs, which is a result of corruption and the accelerating pace of corruption, which has been pointed out that in the Bakiyev government, the, the level of corruption, the depth of corrup corruption intensified tremendously. Um, really by focusing on corruption and coming up with concrete ways of being more transparent in the way in which funds are provided for rent and other aspects of the base, the United States can, can best, you know, best represent itself and put the base issue to rest and address the focus on, on the real issue in Kyrgyzstan, which is corruption and its effect on government, okay. which is entirely corrosive. Did you have something to add there? Yeah, just uh, very quickly. Uh, the base faces a very negative media environment, and always has done in Kyrgyzstan from the Russian language press. And a lot of the stories that they run are untrue. They're rumors. They're meant to delegitimize it, accuse the base of doing all sorts of things that they're not doing. So the media terrain is very difficult. And issues like this just keep stacking up on top. Um, now, the Transit Center does have a website now. It's much more proactive than it was a year ago, and I would commend the base for taking some good PR steps. But a lot of the images in the Kyrgyz mind about the base ha have been set. I think our best case scenario, a pro-base uh, politician, if we want to use that word, mm -hmm. I think will only be able to run on the promise that they will keep the base but renegotiate some of its legal provisions. I think that's the political space. Uh, um, you know, I think the sort of time for business as usual, no one's going to get behind that. Right. Mr. Ambassador, uh, first I'm glad to see you're at UVU. My kids are at BYU next door. Oh. So, mm -hmm. But uh, I, uh, I'm wondering, with uh, there was as much as eight million dollars a month it was thought that might have been skimmed off these oil contracts um, fuel contracts is is there any effort uh, or was this money seized somewhere uh, in these campaigns that will come out or politicians uh, claiming that they can recoup some of this money and is that a way that uh, that they can through transparency and whatnot what not legitimize the, the existence of the base at least? Is there an effort to seize the, the money that uh, has been skimmed? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or is that money just gone now? Uh, uh, you know, I think it uh, requires a serious investigation and uh, uh, from the Kyrgyz side and the uh, U.S. side as well. But uh, uh, first of all, uh, the hearings and uh, transparency in the, this process, I think, would uh, help us uh, uh, to maybe to recover part of that money. But the difference with the previous regime that uh, uh, now people, they would uh, um, at least already know that how that money would be spent, not only pre but uh, now current ones uh, for a uh, couple of more years. And uh, uh, I think there is no fear that uh, with the new uh, people, there will be uh, such, a, uh, again, problems like uh, before, because now we have a plurality. So many people on the basis of again, of differences of uh, opinions, they will uh, elaborate uh, the, uh, some decision which uh, uh, benefit uh, society in a uh, more uh, positive way than uh, the previous regime. Previous regime, everything was uh, so clouded and made uh, in secret, and therefore, as a result, it caused uh, such a problems. But now, I think it's uh, uh, worth uh, to do it. And by the way, uh, my guess is that if uh, you would do that, we would ask also uh, the um, uh, economic conditions and uh, uh, question the presence of another base. Uh, which uh, exists in our so Russian one. And by the way, when we signed the uh, agreement with uh, both the United States and Russia in 2001, you know, the uh, reasons were the same. And uh, it's quite an, uh, important for us to see how in this case uh, society would benefit uh, politically, strategically, economically from uh, both uh, cases. So don't be afraid. Thank you. Um. Time. Go ahead. They're trying to trace that money and, and freeze it right now. So there is an ongoing effort to specifically identify the counterparties 
and freeze and secure the funds just to hold it while they then uh, deal with the question of liability and whether it can be recovered. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Driehaus, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for holding this hearing. Um, Dr. Husky, you had talked about uh, the actions of the U.S. Embassy and, and our treatment of opposition leaders uh, leading up um, to, to the change in government. And, and I'm curious as to your opinion as to whether or not structurally at the Embassy um, folks have recognized uh, the failure of, of their actions and what we have done to uh, address that. Or are the same people in place? Uh, you know, we talk a lot about this investigation um, and, and looking at the air base, but I'm wondering if we're also looking internally at the decision-making process at the embassy and whether or not we've learned anything from that and are outwardly uh, expressing uh, signs that, yes, we recognize what we failed to do and we are adjusting for that. Last week I spoke to people in the State Department and the administration. I think there is a recognition that changes have to be made uh, in the embassy. Uh, there was the, the previous ambassador who left, it would have been right about when I arrived in July of 2008, uh, had had a fairly active agenda with opposition members. And the new ambassador, uh, Ambassador Gefeller, uh, adopted a very different policy. Uh, I understand, again, simply from second-hand accounts that there was some disagreement with that policy in the embassy itself, and I'm afraid you'll have to go elsewhere to find more detail about this, but uh, uh, obviously an ambassador would not, it seems to me, on her own be able to make uh, such an important decision as to um, stand aside from the opposition and the democratic uh, change-oriented forces in a country that would have had to have been something known and approved in Washington. So but it's your it, understanding that uh, the policies that were being pursued uh, were being instructed, you know, or driven by by the State Department in Washington, not necessarily driven by the ambassador. I would so assume. Have have there been outward signs uh, at the embassy? Uh, to the government. I mean, there, there's been mention of, you know, the way in which we could help fund education, how we could pay for the elections. You know, we talk about the path forward, as Mr. Horton suggested. Um, you know, the, the investigation is important, but are there other things that the MC could be doing uh, to show that we've learned our lessons, to show that, in fact, we are working uh, cooperatively with the government, we are rooting out um, some of the corruption uh, that has been identified and we are on a new path. Have there been outward signs to that effect from the embassy? The embassy has certainly been talking to the interim government and, and very actively. Uh, it's probably early days to re-engage with NGOs, but I would assume they would do that and they would do that again very actively. There, there are a number of projects that the United States probably ought to get involved in in that region, some of them in infrastructural projects that would assist them in hydroelectric uh, production. Russia has gotten involved in a very big way with a kind of demonstration project, a huge scale project that's now uh, somewhat uncertain as to when it's going to be finished. But there are a lot of small scale hydroelectric things that we could do in the United States that I think would bring terrific economic and political benefits to both sides. M Mr. Ambassador. I would like just to uh, add maybe uh, the uh, view of the outsider, because five years I was out of the uh, decision making in Bishkek and uh, also dealing with the U.S. Embassy. I think that it's, it would be uh, difficult to blame just the ambassador of, uh, uh, in such uh, changes in the policy. Uh, and uh, my guess that uh, here the uh, uh, opinion of Scott is quite an important. That the United States uh, probably uh, already uh, decided not to treat our country as a fellow democracy, but just a, a regular case of the corrupted and failed state. And we could see so many opinions, not only among the uh, State Department people, but also among the um, community of experts. Uh, in 2005, I uh, was surprised by the fact that uh, uh, President Nazarbayev used the case of the Kyrgyzstan as a mocking in order to uh, be re-elected uh, for the uh, next uh, time. And uh, uh, it was uh, surprising that uh, uh, neither US or, or experts in the West, they just 
looked at that uh, case as uh, uh, something which is uh, indifferent for them. You know, our country was used as a uh, again, case of the, again, uh, violent one and failed one. And, uh, 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 here we already started to lose its uh, connections based on the uh, respect to the values and shared values as well. And uh, Bakiev, we have to uh, uh, also take into account, he did all of the efforts in order to cut ties with the United States. He never ever expressed his desire to come to Washington, D.C. During his case, you know, four diplomats were expelled from uh, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, you know, it's unimaginable. It's unimaginable to expel uh, for almost uh, nothing. And uh, uh, I uh, can understand that the ambassador, when she came to her new position, there was already a whole trend. Now it is necessary to change, again, to restore our uh, again, uh, attention based on the multi-dimensional cooperation, where they, uh, that, uh, uh, again, uh, educational, uh, uh, then, uh, people's diplomacy exchanges, and other things so could restore that credibility and uh, uh, will be a different uh, attitude. Thank you, sir. Mr. Turner, you're recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Patton, you mentioned that you know, perhaps they weren't hearing the word democracy enough uh, from us, so my, my question is about democracy. Um, I would like each of you, if you would, to give us um, your thoughts on what are the, um, uh, what's the transition look like? You know, is it possible uh, to for them to transition to democracy, and what can we do to help? Of all the, uh, and, and I'm sorry, Mr. Patton, before you begin, because I have a feeling that that may take up most of my time for you to each give your thoughts on democracy. I want to ask unanimous consent uh, from the chairman. I have an article that's regardless of who's in power, uh, we have an ally in need by Eric Stewart, former U.S. Department of Commerce De Deputy Assistant Secretary for Europe and Eurasia, which just sounds many of the themes that I know you're going to be telling us. Without objection, we'll, uh, that will be put on the record. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patton. Mr. Patton. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Kyrgyzstan has uh, for some time been seen among all the Central Asian states as the most pluralistic, with the most uh, opportunities for um, uh, citizen participation. And certainly during the Akayev period, that was seen um, to, a, to a far greater extent than in Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan or obviously Turkmenistan. Um, the repressions increased over the Bakiyev term, but there, there, there is an experience in Kyrgyzstan of, uh, of, of civic entitlement that does not exist elsewhere in Central Asia. And for that reason, there is an opportunity, particularly in this next six months, in the three months leading up to the constitutional referendum and then uh, in, in the fall elections. Um, the, the key issue is really going to be the legitimacy of the interim government. This is an unelected government, whereas Bakiyev was elected, albeit by a rigged election. Um, so the best way that they can approach that from the standpoint of democracy is to engage civil society, which is reasonably strong in Kyrgyzstan relative to other Central Asian countries. There is an independent public council of strong civil society groups that's played a very constructive role in the last two weeks. They've engaged in an effort to try and ease tensions between Bakiyev before he left the country and the interim government, and they've offered draft legislation already uh, to be considered in issues such as uh, freedom of the media and uh, reform of police uh, and law enforcement. Um, so encouraging and supporting civil society uh, is probably the best thing we can do in the next three to six months. Well, I agree with Sam Patton on every single point he made. They're exactly right, up and down the list. Uh, and I think uh, acting decisively, vocally, and with funds to support these elections, to support the Constitution process is extremely important. Enabling civil society, ensuring that it plays a vibrant role, as I'm sure it can in this process, is critical. And I think uh, Kyrgyzstan is a standout in this entire region. It's a country where there are, in fact, millions of people who deeply care about democracy and civil liberties. They're willing to take to the streets for it, to stand up and die for it. Uh, they've overturned two governments uh, over this. Uh, it's a unique opportunity, and it's something that forms the basis for a bond with the United States that can be lasting and that can serve our mutual security interests. Yes, I would just underscore that uh, I think the focus should be on encouraging political pluralism, be it in media or civil society. Um, yes, the technical stuff is important in terms of democracy, but it's really uh, creating spaces 
for um, the really the rich uh, political pluralism and diversity of sort of viewpoints and you know external affiliations that the Kyrgyz have. I think that should be the focus. Uh, I would like also to mention here, uh, as an addition, that uh, now it's uh, time to work with the political parties. And during my, uh, again, uh, couple of years, uh, uh, last time uh, interaction with opposition, I could see a couple of uh, really uh, great uh, hopes with uh, several parties. So that's why if uh, uh, we would uh, embolden them, help them, uh, especially not only with creating the party structures, but also some of the um, uh, 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 some some of the uh, bodies which uh, help them to develop programs, you know, analytical research, etc. And they will uh, quite uh, quickly adjust to that. We'll uh, develop uh, quite a sound uh, and uh, uh, long-lasting uh, programs and uh, would be impact. Uh, one of such parties, I would say, um, Atomikin with uh, uh, Tiki Bayo, I was impressed. He's uh, uh, the person who, during that two years, was trying to push that process of uh, engaging the people on uh, using his grassroots level support, and uh, uh, there are quite an impressive developments. Just quickly, I think we've heard about two preconditions that are in place for democracy. One is culture, and one is leadership, with Tekebayev, uh, Ambassador just mentioned, Atumbayeva, Sariyev. But I think the other issue is institutions and what kinds of rules are going to be established in the Constitution drafting. It's my feeling that a parliamentary republic for Kyrgyzstan will be preferable. It will prevent the concentration of power. It will be less likely that we'll have a winner-take-all type election with a presidency. And we see already in the draft that Mr. Tekobayev has put forward, he has the idea of the legitimacy of the opposition, which we take for granted in this country, but which we only developed in the early 19th century in the United States. And Kyrgyzstan and many other countries in the world are trying to do that. He's trying to institutionalize this by actually giving the opposition the chairmanships of the two key committees in the next parliament. That would be the budget committees and the defense committees. Frankly, I'm not sure that would work. <laughs> but at least there's the idea of creating institutions that are going to prevent a concentration of power. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. You can pretty much bet that wouldn't be working around here. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Welch, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you. The, is, uh, I really appreciate your testimony, uh, but I, I want to ask a question about what appears to me to be a, an irresolvable conflict. Get your thoughts on that. On the one hand, uh, the necessity for the American military is to have a secure uh, supply line, uh, and that obviously is to uh, protect our troops. And that need is coming in, con in that need suggests uh, to accomplish it a, a partner that they can deal with, corrupt or not. And that urgency of supplying our troops is going to take precedence, uh, I would think, over uh, any other goals. Uh, what you have been describing are, in effect, uh, pro democracy goals uh, that uh, I certainly support. Uh, but in the real world, uh, particularly with the pressure uh, that is on our troops, uh, is going to be considered a luxury. So how do you do both, or do we have to face the fact that we can't do both? I'll start with you, Dr. Husky. I th it is going to be very difficult to do both, but the reality is that if they elect a government that isn't willing to extend the air base, please, uh, there's not much we can do about it except offer a lot more money. And I think money will speak in a country that has right. a very small GDP, struggling budget, economic crisis. I think there are ways, therefore, that even if we have a very negative outcome in the fall, that we may be able to, to counterbalance that. But uh, I think it is going to be a very heavy price we would have to Ambassador? pay. Ambassador, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you much for asking such a question. I think uh, uh, now we have uh, more hopes uh, in, uh, with this uh, second upheaval that uh, uh, society and uh, political structures which we are creating would be more receptive to the uh, variety of the opinions. And uh, I think that uh, uh, no need here to be afraid that uh, if a ruling party will make such a decision. Now we'll have uh, more voices in order to oppose. And uh, you could see that, uh, for example, I have an opinion that this is a base 
case which has a strategically important uh, meaning for the Kyrgyz Republic. I know several opposition leaders, hardliners, who are saying base is necessary to keep there. Why? Because, you know, we already sacrificed 55 uh, lives and the uh, uh, situation in Afghanistan is worse than it uh, was in 1999. Therefore, you know, it's, uh, uh, it is something where there uh, will be no decision like Bakiev. Money in the pocket, Thank you. and that's it. Let me keep going. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Yeah. Uh, Dr. I, Cooley. I, no, I mean, I think this is the dilemma. I would make two points. One is because of the different things that the base uh, meant to us and to the Kyrgyz, I think threats that the Kyrgyz somehow evict the U.S. Uh, were not credible. In other words, I think we had considerable more leeway for maneuver on the political issues uh, than we thought at the time, number one. Number two, planning for political change, especially in an important overseas base host, that has to be part of the strategic planning effort. Hedging our bets, reaching out to potential future political leaders. Um, it's not an all or, uh, all or nothing proposition because we have a lot of historical cases here. The Philippines, we didn't manage the opposition well there. Thailand, Spain, Greece, Turkey, Okinawa, even the backlash in Korea that you see, all of these uh, uh, have to do with sort of, you know, democratizing forces, uh, you know, coming in and re-examining basing relationships because somehow they were linked to sort of the past. So I would make that strategic planning part of the way how we think about the base uh, mm -hmm. in, in an everyday sense. Okay, thank you. Mr. Horton. I would say I Thank think you. we have to start by recognizing there will be situations where imperative concerns of national security will justify a departure from normal procurement rules. I'll put it, you know, mildly. Uh, but I'm not sure. In fact, I, I, I believe that Kyrgyzstan was not such a case. And where the appropriate effort to do it the right way needed to be made and wasn't made. And I think there's also another really fundamental point that I think Alex just made. I'll put it in slightly different terms. It's a question of whether we're focused on a short-term or a long-term relationship. If it's a short-term, well, you know, corners will be cut and we don't care. If we want to have a long-term relationship with this country, we want to have a facility there for the long term, and that's a politically very hot issue, of course, then we've got to, we have to modulate our behavior accordingly. And we have to respect them and show respect for their institutions, their aspirations for rule of law and democracy. We haven't done that. That, I think, was, uh, you know, a, a serious error in Kyrgyzstan. And now it's up to us to draw conclusions about it and try and straighten the situation up. Congressman, your question is really uh, central in terms of whether or not we can do both, and I believe we can do both on the basis of accumulated experience and looking at where, where we have been successful and where we haven't been successful. As Ambassador Abdrasayev uh, uh, mentioned in his opening remarks, having, having served the Kyrgyz government at the time the base was initially opened, it is in the Kyrgyz national security interest to have an American presence there. And uh, the, the, the tide seems to have shifted in Central Asia, where in the 1990s, when the Americans first showed up in Central Asia, all of the states understood that there was a strategic value in having the United States present. Now that we're in the position of appearing to be blackmailed uh, by, a, by a dictator, uh, other dictators are looking at that and seeing possible opportunities. We have to shift back to the strategic questions while, uh, while applying the lessons learned. Thank you, Mr. Welch. So, Mr. Horton, at this juncture, is there any information uh, that you are aware of that suggests that the Department of Defense purposely designed the fuel service contracts to enrich the first families? It seems to me that the Department of Defense absolutely accepted that that might be the most expedient way to proceed. You should have Definitely. been a diplomat. That is, that's the perception, the very broad perception inside Kyrgyzstan. We see that charge being made dramatically by uh, the Chief of Staff, Adil Basalov, a number of other people. I frankly, looking at the details of how these contracts were structured, who was involved with them, uh, I find it very difficult to refute that. Uh, I think it's likely that we're going to see the Defense Department say, well, in the end of the day, we got the fuel, we got it on time, and we got it for a reasonable price, so who cares? 
And uh, the answer to that's got to be, you know, two governments fell in part because of this. So it really does make a big difference, and it really has disturbed our relationship with this country, which at one point was clearly the most pro-American country in Central Asia, and today may no longer be that. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so it begs the question, or, or the answer, I guess, that certainly they could have taken steps to steer those contracts away from the private uh, interested uh, companies and to another government type of entity or, or something a little more national in, in nature on that. How would that have looked? I think they could have gone through a transparent public bidding process for the contracts. Uh, and they, they should have, what we, you would have seen probably uh, was an effort by Kyrgyz authorities to uh, rig the process so that only one company would be available as a possible provider or bidder. Um, but I think the U.S. would have come out of this much better if it went through a public process and procurement, set it up for bids, uh, and awarded it. In the end of the day, if it wound up going to a company that was controlled by the president, if that happened as a result of an open public process because that was the only company that was capable of fulfilling the contracts, we'd be a lot better off. Well, I think we already have evidence that that was not the case uh, on that. But Ambassador, let me ask you, for a country the size of uh, Kyrgyzstan, and now the, the $64 million lease number, I guess, people banding around, what would that money have meant to Kyrgyzstan if it had not been uh, dissipated in, into other uh, corrupt parties or whatever? What would it do for a country like Kyrgyzstan to have the use of that money? I think it's uh, uh, the discretion of the government, and probably if uh, they would, uh, uh, there would be a process of the uh, opening uh, open uh, bidding, you know, they will uh, see how uh, through the taxes it will be distributed to different uh, needs of uh, the uh, people, and uh, they could explain it. But with the government of the Bakiev, probably this was not the case. They were interested in different uh, uh, things. This tax, this, uh, uh, you mean not about uh, uh, additional uh, uh, to the uh, oil? I think, uh, again, through the uh, budget, they could uh, uh, show that uh, to use for the paying of the uh, salaries and uh, uh, sustain some of the other projects. But my guess here that uh, uh, the uh, base issue is uh, not the... Uh, uh, the um, how to say, uh, the problem that uh, now we have a bottleneck in Kyrgyzstan and base is becoming just uh, uh, one of the uh, few projects and we need uh, here more diversity. Still, uh, the problem will continue further in the future and we have to work on that issue as well. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Husky, how does that number relate to the overall GDP of, uh, of Kyrgyzstan? The, at least. I think it's something like three percent. I mean, this is a—it's not higher. This is a—it's a significant amount of money, and sure. it clearly could have been put to very good use uh, for the Kyrgyz people if this money had not been siphoned off. Um, you know, it is—it is a trick because if even if you have open tender, even if you have a competitive bidding process, uh, it is possible in a Bakiev-like environment for people surrounding the family after the fact to come in and horn their way into these legitimate businesses. This has happened one time after another in Kyrgyzstan and other parts of the post-communist world. But at least the original bidding should be competitive and above board. Thank you. Mr. Dryhouse, you care to ask any more questions? I'd just like to ask one final question. If we could run through the panel, you know, clearly uh, uh, the United States has, has suffered a blow in terms of its legitimacy in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and with respect to the long-term interests of the United States in the region and in the country, um, and, and I think we've discussed some of this, but just what are your one or two things that you believe we should be focusing on um, that would uh, support the long-term interests, not just of Kyrgyzstan, but also of the United States, which I believe would also benefit us in the short term with regard to the base? Mm -hmm. Dr. Husky. Well, I think something that hasn't been talked about is the role of Russia in this. Russia has been a, a very important player in bringing about the revolution, in trying to expel the United States in the first place. And so this is not just a U.S. Kyrgyz issue. 
there is a triangular aspect to this. And so I think we, we have to frame it in that way. Uh, Russia is trying to expand its sphere of influence, understandably, after the difficult decades for, for them of the 1990s. Um, and and to, what, to what extent, you know, why it wanted to expel the United States, was that simply a sphere of influence issue? Was it trying to have a bargaining chip with the U.S. on other perhaps uh, larger issues of bilateral matters between the two countries? Uh, I, I'm not sure. but. Um, let me just stop there, and I'll, I'll let my colleagues add. I think that uh, uh, the issue series about investments, which I already mentioned, quite an important one. And uh, um, I uh, planned at the beginning not to raise that issue, but probably it is a uh, time. Uh, Kyrgyzstan from 1998 is the only country of the WTO in the region. And from that time, you know, during all of the 12 years, it's the only uh, WTO member in the whole region, and China just uh, joined in 2000. So you could imagine that uh, uh, 12 years ago, 200% of tariffs were erected, barrier against all our goods, and this is a factor which is contributes to the poverty, unemployment, and desperation. So we need more investments. And the people, then they will be happy. That's it. And the Kazakhstan, uh, sorry, by the way, who is uh, teaching us about many things, they're also contributing to our poverty as well. Why? 200 percent. You know, I would like to hear to say, like uh, President uh, Reagan said in, you know, famous phrase, uh, Mr. Nazarbayev, please tear that wall down. And then, you know, it will be a miracle. Our people, they know how to handle it. Thank you. I think one lesson here is that we need to get out of this sort of competitive mindset that uh, our competition with Russia, some type of you know, great game, that zero sum for influence in Central Asia. Uh, I think this is potentially quite destructive because it also leads the Russians to behave in that kind of way, right, where they think any kind of uh, blow that they can strike against our presence there uh, is a gain for them. Um, so I think Part of it has to be recalibrating the mindset, being very clear as to what our goals are in Central Asia, right? Are they access to the base? That's not the same thing as undermining Russia, right? And, 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 and working, I think, in a more consultative way with Moscow would, uh, would behoove us. Uh, I see three-way competition in Central Asia between Russia, the U.S., and China. China did more trade with Central Asia in 2009 than Russia. And so in this relationship. Central Asia is not our backyard, right? Afghanistan's backyard. We need to have a distinct brand. What do we stand for that China doesn't stand for and that Russia doesn't stand for? And so this is why we get back to the importance of things like transparency and investment, engaging on a range of sort of social and democracy issues, uh, things that the two other regional powers don't do. I think that will be part of our brand in Central Asia moving forward. I think the path to our retention of our position with this base starts with our demonstration that this relationship is not just about the base, that it's more, that there's a more, there's a broader foundation for it, that we care about democracy, we care about human rights, but especially that we care about education. That's, you know, when you press Kyrgyz, when they say you really don't care about anything in the base and you, you press them, is that really true? Then frequently they'll sort of grudgingly say, oh, well, of course we recognize you did do all these things in the education sector. There's the American University that was set up. There was support for secondary education. There was English language training. Uh, there were scholarships. Frankly, the best invested money we put into Kyrgyzstan easily has been in the education sector, and it has been the basis for popular support in Kyrgyzstan for the broader security relationship. It's students from Kyrgyzstan who go to high schools in the U.S., who go to colleges, who get master's degrees and come. Those are the people who say, this isn't a bad idea. We need to sustain that relationship. We need to learn that lesson and we need to continue that investment. 
Um, I, I, I would put forth that Kyrgyzstan is the only country in the region where there has been regime change since independence. You could argue that in, in Turkmenistan, Turkmenbashi died and he was succeeded by his doctor, but it's essentially the same thing. There's now been two rounds of regime change in Kyrgyzstan, and the second round has been more violent than the first. So I think, you know, our strategic interest is in institutionalizing a way for regime change in a democratic, uh, uh, according to a democratic procedure, in Central Asia that will serve as a model for the other countries, because this is the looming question for uh, Uzbekistan, for, for Kazakhstan, for the other countries. How, how, how does succession happen? And I think Kyrgyzstan presents an excellent opportunity to look at uh, better models for succession, and that could really be uh, America's legacy in the region. As, as Dr. Cooley said, it's really a question of having the American brand be one of values, and that's what the people of Central Asia are looking towards. Thank you very much. Mr. Fortenberry, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for coming today. I'm sorry I've missed the balance of your testimony, and I apologize if some of this is a bit repetitive, but I think, Mr. Ambassador, you may be best suited to answer this first question. Um, culturally speaking, what is the disposition of the people of Kyrgyzstan toward the United States as we look toward uh, some of what was just discussed here, longer-term relationships, empowering governance capacities, particularly in terms of, of of peaceful transfers of power and, and long-term stability in the country for the well-being of, of the people, but also clearly to secure interests that we have, such as our own base. Uh, according to the um, poll, which was uh, uh, probably last year by the uh, IRI, in uh, Kyrgyzstan we have a quite uh, a negative trend towards uh, the United States. Uh, feelings are uh, not good. And probably because of uh, the, some of the uh, promises which were not uh, fulfilled. But uh, and partly also this process was inflamed by the uh, um, trends from the Russian Federation and the policies from the uh, regime which is now uh, was changed. And uh, um, uh, in general, if uh, we would uh, again implement that uh, suggestions which my colleague just uh, made, education, grassroots level uh, education and uh, support more to those uh, forces which we have already there, civil society, uh, NGOs, media, you know, they could start flourish, then we'll uh, change it. Tight uh, dramatically, and uh, in, in parallel also, base would continue to exist. Uh, it's my uh, again uh, opinion that uh, uh, people they uh, could understand how to balance that uh, uh, together, and uh, uh, it's time for us just to be very very proactive, and uh, uh, people of uh, Kyrgyzstan would understand that uh, uh, clearly. We um, I agree also with the opinion of uh, my colleague from the Freedom House that it is a second change regime in uh, Kyrgyzstan. Unfortunately, we lost its time during uh, five years in order to do that in an orderly way. And now it is uh, time to show that how it is possible to do in uh, Central Asia something which, uh, by the way, happened quite uh, successfully in Mongolia. Uh, same thing. Uh, country, small size, you know, but five, six times changes the regime, and now it's a, a full-fledged democracy, you know, something where we have to look at the uh, lessons and to, to work uh, quite inactively. Mongolia, by the way, is a partner country with the House Democracy Partnership Commission on which I serve, one of the early recipients of this uh, opportunity to be in dialogue with us on an ongoing basis as to how we build their technical capacity in their parliament, their legislature. And uh, so you're right, that's a good example in, in the region there. Does Russia actively connive at fomenting this anti-American spirit, or is it just part of uh, the broader organic movement in the area at this point in time? Uh, you know, Russia now is uh, trying to regain uh, its influence in the region and in Kyrgyzstan as well. And uh, we have to admit that uh, Russia have a legitimate uh, uh, rights uh, to uh, be there in their territory. And uh, pro-Russian <coughs> pro sentiments are quite uh, great. And uh, I think that it's a time also for us to see how to uh, work uh, together with Russia. And if even uh, Russia was involved in the change of the regime, probably it's also a sign that uh, Russia uh, have uh, quite uh, high stakes in uh, promoting the regimes which are uh, not so uh, 
looking towards the feudalism like uh, previous uh, uh, government of the Bakiv tried to uh, create. And uh, I have plenty of examples which uh, uh, before Russia and uh, US uh, tried to implement in Central Asia to the benefits of the uh, Kyrgyz Republic. So it's time also to find uh, the common goals. Well, somebody made the point that uh, to convict the people that it's not necessary to pick a side here but to actively engage in their own well-being by active engagement, constructive engagement with the United States, constructive engagement with Russia, uh, is an, a potential outcome that is beneficial to, to them particularly, but would also help stabilize our relationship, I assume. Dr. Cooley, did you want to? No, I, I would just also make the point um, that ever since the apparent double cross uh, of Bakiev against Putin last year, uh, right, when uh, Russia offered a $2 billion uh, package of investments and assistance to close down the base. The base closure was announced and then was walked back. Relations between Moscow uh, and uh, Bishkek really deteriorated to an all-time low, and Russia really launched an all-out soft power blitz in the media that really undermined the Bakiev regime, you know, calling him corrupt and nepotistic, drawing attention to these aspects of his rule. It was an onslaught, and it put us in an embarrassing position where, you know, it was the Kremlin for its very own cynical political purposes that was drawing attention to these governance issues that we were relatively silent on. So Russia, through its soft power, through these cultural influences, uh, also through the fact that uh, Kyrgyz workers uh, live and work in Russia and send home remittances, which comprise anywhere from 30 40 percent of Kyrgyz GDP. For all these reasons, uh, Kyrgyzstan's connections with Russia are, are, are quite close, and we need to take that into account. It's a certain irony in your, what you just said, though. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Fortenberry. Let me thank all of the witnesses uh, for giving up your time today and sharing your expertise. Uh, you can't get rid of us very easily, so I'm hoping that you all will send to us uh, being able to call on you at some point in the future if we want to uh, take advantage of your knowledge and your uh, understanding and your expertise. So I'll, I'll take those little nods of your head as, as a sent to that, and I appreciate it. I mean, you've been a tremendous help to us in setting the table for what I think are going to be some pretty extensive hearings and in depth, and I think you've let us have some context to where we ought to go on that. So I, I want to thank all of you. Uh, Ambassador, thank you, uh, especially uh, for your difficult times that you're, you're experiencing. And, and uh, it's our hope that this investigation does serve the purpose of lending some transparency and accountability uh, to the situation that's gone for everybody involved, uh, for the United States and for uh, people in Kyrgyzstan, uh, in that we just find out what happened and who the players were and what they did, and we can then determine whether it was good, bad, or indifferent and act accordingly from there to make sure that we build a stronger relationship and uh, take a good path forward. I do want to just say that I, I know one thing that's a common thread on this is that, you know, we, we can't always have just a military priority solely and lead with the military, put that as our foremost priority, treat it as if it's the only one or whatever. We've got to have a more whole of government approach, as somebody mentioned earlier on this, and reach out diplomatically as well. Uh, rule of law issues, democracy, all of those things are important. Uh, and in that context, I think that we may get more cooperation out of friends uh, and allies if we show a deeper interest and a longer range interest uh, in their well-being. Uh, and then that should encompass some of our mutual uh, priorities as well. So thank you all for being here and for all that you've done for this committee. We appreciate it. Thank the members of the panel as well. Meeting adjourned.